faith is a very abstract concept how do you define faith how do you speak of faith how do you qualify faith but faith expresses itself as certain emotions and one of those emotions is fearlessness faith is fearlessness right and that is why when swami would raise both his hands and bless us swami would call it abhaya hasta right he it's a conferring of abhaya it's a conferring of fearlessness and when swami is giving us fearlessness swami is actually gifting us faith i offer my most loving pranams at bhagwan's lotus feet i pray to swami that he gives us all the understanding that it is swami who speaks and it is swami who listens through each one of us salam to all of you it's wonderful to be with all of you here thank you for this opportunity to connect with all of you i hope uh, all of you are keeping safe wherever you are and uh, whatever is the situation that swami creates around us he also gives us the opportunity of having satsang and all that and i think we are very very grateful to that whenever i'm invited to talk especially to an audience of elders my saram to all the elders my saram to all the sisters and brothers i often wonder what is it that i can tell you about swami that probably you already don't know especially seniors you know whose whose association with swami is as many years as you know been around right so what is it about swami that i can convey to all of you that you probably would not know already but having said that who can claim that they know swami enough that's a question that often comes to mind and is there anybody you can say that i have grasped enough about, enough about swami i have understood enough about swami and uh, there is nothing more to know all the scriptures you know be it the sanatan dharma scriptures or the bible the quran one common thing about all of them is their description of god they describe god as the unknowable some some entity that cannot be grasped through our mundane comprehension through our perceptions having said that why do we then try to understand swami at all why do we even make the attempt there is this very beautiful verse from our scriptures i often uh, like to go back to that it says brahma vid brahmaiva bhavati those who try to understand god eventually transform into divinity in the process of trying to understand god itself right that's a quote which is very popular so i used to quote it very often and uh, even as i am narrating this i am reminded of what uh, one old devotee once told me and uh, this was an analogy that swami had given him swami was saying that you know when you first come to swami in the first few years when you come to swami swami will make himself predictable swami will make himself accessible through being predictable so you would know that swami likes this if you do this swami will be upset if you do this swami will be happy if you sit here swami will come and talk to you if you do this particular thing you will get an interview right even as students we have a lot of these things and uh, many of these things also seem to work right so swami was telling this devotee once that i am like a wild horse that is sitting in solitude a wild horse when it's left alone it seems very calm right it's quietly sitting in one corner so swami is saying that you will see that wild horse and you will say this horse is not so wild after all now probably i can mount it and i can uh, go for a ride so you will come close to the horse the horse will be still be sitting there without any movement and then you you will uh, you know become adventurous enough to try to mount it and the horse will still keep quiet and then after you get on to the horse swami said the horse will start becoming a little wild will try to shrug you off and swami said that that's precisely what i do <laughs> he said when you first come to me i make myself very accessible you will feel that oh swami is so uh, you know warm and swami is so welcoming then i will shake you a little bit and then you will think that oh i don't know the swami 
I don't understand this, Swami. And then Swami said, but don't worry, I will not shake you off. And then I'll calm down. And then again, you will get the feeling that uh, now I've got a grip of Swami. Now I understand Swami. And then when you get that feeling again, Swami said, I will shake a little more firmly, a little more uh, vigorously. So this whole journey of trying to understand Swami is like that. Swami just lets us understand enough so that we get enough confidence not to stop. Right? If we cannot understand at all, if Swami is absolutely an enigma, then we will not make efforts to try to understand Swami. So he kind of lets us uh, feel that, yeah, now I know Swami. Now I understand Swami. Right? As speakers, all of us try to do that. You know, this is what Swami likes. And you know, when a devotee did like this, Swami said like this. We try to describe Swami by a few handful of incidents and there's nothing more uh, unintelligible than that. But that's what we always do because that is the whole process. But how do you best know Swami? Right? When you say that Brahma with Brahma with Bhavati, there will come a time when you completely understand Swami and that will happen only when you have completely become Swami. So how do you best understand Swami? Is there a way? Is there a method? Is there a technique? Is there a hint? There is this very beautiful shloka in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna tells how you can understand me. Right? And that's, I think, a hint for all of us how you can understand Swami. The shloka goes, many of you may be familiar with that. Bhaktiya maam abhijanati yavan yaschasmi tattvataha. He says, through bhakti you can understand me. Bhaktiya maam abhijanati. Through bhakti alone you can understand me. And then he qualifies that understanding. He says, yavan yaschasmi tattvataha. Which means you come to know me as I am. As my tattva. Right? It's not a superficial knowledge of God. It is not a frivolous idea of what Swami is. But Swami says, as I am, as my reality, as my tattva, you come to know me. And then the second line, he says, tato maam tattvato nyatva vishate tat anantaram. Having known me as my tattva, you become part of me. You enter into me, literally. Right? That's the, that's the Brahmavit, Brahmaiva Bhavati part. So here is Swami himself giving the hint. How do you understand Swami? How do you uh, figure out this phenomenon that we've had this opportunity to come uh, cross paths with? He says it can be understood through bhakti. But honestly speaking, that's not enough data for us because bhakti is as much cryptic and as much uh, complex to understand as God himself. So what is bhakti? You know, when you join for, a degree, uh, join for a college, join into a college for a degree or you sign up for a course, you cannot choose the criteria for receiving the degree, right? The institution decides what is the criteria for you to receive that degree. In the same manner, when we come to Swami, you and I cannot qualify what is bhakti. What is bhakti has to be qualified by the one who is going to give us the certificate that here is my devotee. Here is my bhakta. So if we really want to understand what is bhakti, I think we'll have to turn to Swami's definition of what is bhakti. Has Swami given a definition which we can fall back upon? Most certainly he has and he has done it very, very early in his avataric life. Way back in 1947, when Swami wrote that beautiful letter to his brother with a lot of declarations, a lot of promises to all of us, Swami makes this Wonderful statement, right? Where he says that I will take care of the whole world, I'll hold your hand and I'll take you to your path and all of that. And Swami says in Telugu, Manchi Chedalukuda Manasulo Samamuga Bhavinjo Chundute Bhakti Naku. You might have any definition of bhakti, but if you ask me what is my definition of bhakti, Swami says, Manchi Chedalukuda, good and bad, pain and pleasure. Happiness and sorrow. Manasulo samamuga bhavin chuchundute. If you are able to see them as being equal, that is devotion for me. Right? So this is Swami's definition of what is bhakti. To treat good and bad equal-mindedly, with equal my equanimity, is devotion as explained by Swami. If you really look at this definition, uh, if you look at what Swami says about 
surrender what swami says about sharanagati atma nivedanam it is the same definition right whenever we are invited to give talks thanks to all the samarpan sessions that uh, centers like dharmakshetra do we listen to a lot of those talks that's where we gather all our stories from so uh, i don't I've, i've been careful not to choose stories that i've heard in dharmakshetra samarpan but nevertheless i think all of you must have heard that very beautiful uh, episode that bhagya sir narrated about being a full time devotee right when swami says what is it to be a part time devotee and what is it to be a full time devotee swami gives the same definition he says to have equal mindedness ups and downs come in life to see them as being same that is devotion so if you look at it that way for swami there is no difference between bhakti and sharanagati there is no distinction between devotion and surrender it is we who make that distinction for swami you are a devotee if you have surrendered if you have not surrendered you are not a devotee going by the definition that swami has given how a definition of devotion is we listen to a bhajan we shed a few tears we feel that that's devotion on saturday sunday we go out and we feed a few poor people we think that is devotion or we join satsangs like this and listen to beautiful stories of swami and yes we we definitely emotionally feel connected to swami right but is that devotion i think swami says no there is this very beautiful episode uh, i often quote this in most of the satsangs swami has written this in the book ramakatha raswaini this is the first interaction between sugriva and lord rama right in his quest to find where mother sita is he comes to kishkinta he meets hanuman hanuman takes him to sugriva and sugriva tells about his whole plight how vali has treated him very badly and fairly and all of that and uh, so they decide that they're going to make a friendship pact rama has got to help sugriva and sugriva will help rama find mother sita but sugriva is not too sure whether rama is capable enough to deal with his brother because his brother is very mighty we all know the story of uh, the the tiff between the two of them we know how vali was much more stronger than ravana himself right and they had a hint that they're going to battle ravana at that time so sugriva had this doubt you know will will rama really be able to deal with my brother so it is at that time rama kind of figures out and intuitively knows that this is the thought that's troubling uh, sugriva and he says i know that you want some proof of my might so you think of a way of testing my abilities so then sugriva comes up with this idea he said that you know when we were children we used to have a lot of these games between us and one of the things that we did was we used to go to a place where there are a row of palm trees and we would fire arrows at them and we would see how many trees can one arrow that we shoot fell so he says that you know uh, i managed to put down uh, three trees but sugri was so strong that he was able to put down five trees so he says probably we'll use the same test i'll take you to a place where there, there are a row of palm trees and you shoot an arrow let's see how it works so they take rama to a place and there are seven trees in a row and each one of those trees are five times bigger than the tree that vali had shot down so sugriva says here are a row of palm trees and in his mind is thinking that these palm trees are so strong that even if two trees fall rama is stronger or strong enough to battle with vali rama smiles at this little frivolous test that is being given to him and he takes an arrow and swami writes that when he shoots the seven trees fall the seven trees are taken and are thrown beyond the mountains crashing past the small hillocks that come on the way and the moment sugriva sees this he realizes that rama is not an ordinary prince he realizes that this is the avatar the lord himself has come down so instantly sugriva falls down to his knees and he says oh lord rama you are the great one and you are the lord himself and then he says you know what a petty thing i'm coming to you for i don't want to uh, you know battle with my brother i don't want my kingdom back i have found you and i want to serve you all my life and that's more than enough i don't want anything else I forget about the battle with bali and all of that so rama tells him it's all right uh, but i've given you my word so let's call bali for a battle and let's meet him 
so we all know how the story goes wali comes and uh, the first battle rama is not able to make out he doesn't shoot sugriva comes back completely battered right he's completely wounded and uh, he's beaten black and blue by wali and he comes back and he says rama you ditched me right i i trusted you and this is what you do to me and he said at least had you told me that you're not prepared i would have gone gone more prepared <laughs> you know as though he had uh, the ability to do that and he kind of loses himself and he says oh, why have you done this to me and how do i trust you as a friend and all that then swami writes very beautifully that rama says sugriva what do i do i couldn't see the distinction between you and wali he says i couldn't see the distinction between you and wali and swami says these were not ordinary words these had a subtle meaning one meaning is wali was also a devotee of rama he says so when you both stand i can't see one greater than the other and the other thing is both of them are monkeys right and both of them have that wavering faith or wavering devotion so rama says i couldn't find the difference between the two of you what do i do so then he puts the garland swami says that garland represents the extra grace that god gives to a devotee even before he has begin to deserve it right and that speaks of the chance that most of us get right swami gives us something a little more than we deserve hoping that one day we would transform our lives and come to deserve that so the story goes that rama puts this uh, garland around wali and uh, i'm sorry sugriva and goes for the battle wali is uh, killed at this time but before this another interesting event happens when sugriva comes back with his body completely wounded rama pacifies him and rama tells him don't worry we'll take a battle again and that time i will help you and he begins to carry sugriva's limbs wherever he is wounded <clears throat> and even as rama puts his hand through those different wounds the wounds heal just by the stroke of rama's hands on those uh, limbs and the moment this happens sugriva says oh my god rama what did i do i scolded you i forgot that who you are you are this great god and again he starts i don't want the kingdom i don't want my family i'm happy to serve you i'll be at your lotus feet and then rama tells him sugriva don't think that this is a expression of devotion this is not devotion this is merely your sentiments these are merely your emotions he clearly says this is not devotion to extol the lord when something good happens and to start cursing him and to get upset with him when something bad happens is not devotion it is only emotion and i am not touched by this so he says so get up get up prepare yourself go for the battle but you know the beauty is these are words of swami right and when swami writes this in the ramakatha raswaini i think these are not for sugriva these are for you and me right these are words that swami is telling each one of us devotees that one day you get a promotion in your work you come and sit in bhajans and if you are lost in ecstasy that's not devotion or one day when something really bad happens and you say that i'm not going to turn up for any of swami's work anymore because something bad has happened to me devotion cannot be like that right that kind of a flip flop cannot be any sign of devotion this is very beautiful episode uh, narrated by one of swami's devotees her article is very popular in our uh, website many of you must have read that article series it's by rani subramanyam a very old devotee very profound and deep interactions with swami she narrates this very beautiful incident once it so happens that at one point uh, she is very unwell swami is in the city of madras so she comes to see swami there with her husband and she's just recovering from this illness that she's had so swami tells her that you know why don't you come to brindavan and stay in brindavan for a while till you recoup completely and then you can go back i think they were at that point in from uh, they were from delhi or pune or one of these places in north so she was very happy so from chennai by the time swami comes to brindavan she also comes to brindavan and when she comes to brindavan she has this royal treatment waiting for her there is a sevadal who is coming to the hall and asking who is rani ma swami is waiting for you picks her up from the uh, you know devotees section swami has made arrangements for her to stay in swami's own bungalow in swami's bungalow in swami has given her one of the rooms and 
I mean, which devotee would not love such treatment? Right? So Swami gives her all of this. So one day Swami walks into a room at seven in the morning and uh, Swami takes her to one of the balconies in Swami's bungalow. And Swami asks her, what do you want? Today you ask me for anything I'm going to give you. What do you want? So she's taken aback and she was not prepared for this. So she looks at Swami and she says, uh, Swami, how do I be an ideal devotee? How do I become an ideal devotee? So Swami looked at her and asked, so you want me to tell you what you should do to become an ideal devotee? And she said, yes, Swami, I want to know from you. What should I do to become an ideal devotee? And then Swami went on to explain whatever we've been speaking about. Swami spoke about the equanimity which defines devotion. And Swami told, see, one day when you come to me, I'm going to give you royal treatment. You will be my favorite devotee. I'll roll out the red carpet for you. I'll, we'll be waiting for you. I'll speak very lovingly to you. On another day when you come to me, I'll say, get lost. I don't want to look at your face. And Swami said, if you feel delighted or elated when that happens, when I give you the royal treatment, and when you feel that I don't love you when I give you the other treatment, that is not devotion. And without stopping there, Swami went on to describe an event which happened in her own life a few months back. It's a very beautiful episode where she was saying that Swami was in Vrindavan that time. She was staying with her sister in Bangalore city. And then Swami went away to, I think, uh, Hyderabad or Madras or somewhere. So there was this one Westerner whom Swami had permitted to stay in Bangalore when Swami was away. And this Westerner wanted to learn bhajans and uh, she turned to Ranima and Ranima said, I'll be very happy to teach you. So even when Swami was not there, this uh, devotee would take a train and a bus and multiple conveyances like that from the city of Bangalore. Those days, it was not easy to come all the way to uh, Brindavan in Whitefield. So she would come all the way only so that she could come and teach this devotee bhajans. Right? So she was doing this for a few weeks. And one fine day when she comes, this uh, Westerner devotee, she comes and says, uh, Ranima, today I don't want to learn bhajans because Swami has come back. And today also happens to be my birthday, so I don't want to uh, you know, spend time in the classes. I want to spend time with Swami. So Ranima says, all right, it's okay. But then she says, you've come all the way from Bangalore. You wait here. I will go inside and ask Swami if you can come inside. And I'm sure Swami will have no problem with that. So she goes inside and she asks Swami, Swami, Ranima is here. She's been coming all the while. Uh, when you're away teaching me bhajans, can I call her inside? And immediately Swami's response is, no, tell her to go back to city. So then she starts pleading, Swami, why are you saying this? She's come all the way, she'll be very happy and delighted if you give her darshan. Swami says, no, tell her to go back. And the few other devotees were there, they also tried to uh, plead with Swami and said, Swami, your devotee, you know, she's not like some uh, a stranger or something, why don't you allow her inside? And Swami kept saying, no, ask her to go back. So this foreigner comes out and she looks at Ranima and says, you know, I tried so hard, but Swami is saying that you shouldn't come. So Ranima says, all right, she gets into the train and she says all through that journey back to the city, she was in tears. She says, Swami, why is it you're doing this to me? Swami, you don't love me. Swami, why, you, uh, you know, why is your heart uh, dried up like this? What will you lose if you give me one darshan as though I'm asking for your property? <laughs> you know, all these kind of thoughts and she was you know, there was nobody around so she was sobbing and she was crying and she was very upset with the whole thing after some time after she had cried her heart out and uh, suddenly this thought comes to her why should i cry you know swami knows what is best swami knows what is right i probably cannot understand that swami knows what is right why should i feel upset about that and when this thought comes she calms down and then she's fine after that so Swami narrated this entire episode of how she came teaching and how Swami treated her. After narrating all of this, Swami said, so the first thought that you had was, Swami doesn't love you and you're upset with Swami. The second thought that you had was, Swami knows what is best. Swami told her that first thought should not have come at all. Your first thought should have been, so what? Swami knows what is right. I will accept whatever Swami gives.
Swami said, that should have been your first thought. And if when that becomes your first thought in any situation, then you become an ideal devotee. So this is what Swami very, very clearly says, what is devotion. But uh, the question is, how do we get there? Right. And the hint to that is in the episode that I just narrated. That second thought should become the first thought. And Swami says that practice of telling yourself, whatever happens is good for me, is what we refer to as fate. Right. So devotion is when you're not, you're unmoved by any situation around you. Good happens, bad happens, good health, bad health. Happiness, unhappiness, somebody treats you very well, somebody treats you very badly. If you're being steady in all of this is what devotion is, as defined by Swami. But how do you get there? Swami says the tool for that is there will be ups and downs in life. And when ups and downs come, I think we are all people with emotions. We will feel low sometimes. We will feel, I mean, it's uh, when I'm telling you this, it does not mean that I am there. Right. Whatever I'm telling you, none of that means that I'm there. All of us go through emotions. All of us get demotivated. Something bad happens. We become negative. But when that happens, the tool that Swami gives all of us is at that point, can you remind yourself that whatever happens, whatever Swami gives is good for you. Right. So Swami says that faith is the tool for you to get to that ideal devotion. And when you get to that ideal devotion, you understand God and in that understanding lies your redemption itself. When we go through life, you know, uh, there are a lot of struggles that we undertake very spontaneously in life. We all know what gives us happiness, you know, just the ability to probably uh, sleep all the time, you know, who, who wouldn't like that? You know, be entertained, look and sit in front of the TV, have somebody give you food all the time. You don't have to do anything. But still, each one of us wake up every day in the morning and go for work. When we were children, I, I don't think there are many children who loved going to school. But we still went to school every day. None of us liked the idea of taking exams, but we still took exams. So, which means willfully we were taking on some difficulties, some unpleasantness on ourselves. And that is because we could see the purpose that was there. Right? As Swami would say that you would love to eat as many mangoes as you want. Right? This is the season for that. But you know what would happen if you eat in that manner. So that, that purpose or that idea of what this will do to me on the long run puts, you know, you, you yourself restrain your pleasure. Or you yourself do something which you would not otherwise want to do. So even in life, we always do that. The, the best example that I always uh, like to give is, let's say that uh, you're sick today, right? You're, you're having a very high fever or something and you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you a medicine. And the doctor says, you take this after dinner. You come back home, you take the medicine and let's say that you start developing stomach cramps. Terrible pains, you're not able to sit, you're not able to lie down. So you pick up the phone, you call up the doctor and say, doctor, this is what's happening. And let's say the doctor tells you that it's a good sign that you're having the pain. It means the medicine is working. I'm not too sure if there's a medicine like that, but let's just say that there is something like that. So let's say the doctor says it's good you're having that pain because that shows that the medicine is working. The pain doesn't vanish. But now when there is a purpose to that pain, Somehow that pain seems to be more bearable, isn't it? We are ready to undertake that pain because I know that that pain is doing something good for me. And that's precisely the pain that we are all ready to endure when we do exercise. As I said, when we take up examinations, there are many, many pains in life that we willfully undertake because we are able to see the purpose at the end of it. But when we talk about faith, I think the faith that we are referring to in, in our relationship with Swami is sometimes that purpose, that idea, the reason is hidden. And to believe that there is a purpose, there is a reason, even when it is not obvious to my eyes, is what, is what we refer to as faith, isn't it? 
there is this very very beautiful quote uh, by Rabindranath Tagore. I think it's from uh, his timeless work, the Gitanjali, where he says, uh, "Faith is the bird that sees the light and sings when the dawn is still dark." Very very beautifully captured. It's like a wonderful definition for faith. He says, "Faith is the bird that feels the light and sings when the dawn is still dark." So in life, we will come across many such situations where we don't know where the light is, right? We are surrounded by darkness. We are surrounded by difficulties. There is, I mean, what is, what is right in front of me is only pain and suffering. But the ability to see that there is a purpose behind this, there is a reason behind this, when you're not able to see it very obviously, I think that is what is faith. So sometimes we can see how the pain that we are undergoing is good for us, but sometimes we can't. But believing that this is good for me, telling yourself that I'm sure that in some way, some way this is good for me is what we refer to as faith. And when Swami was physically with us, you know, physically available to us, physically interacting with devotees, I think what he did all through was to demonstrate this kind of this game of faith. There were some devotees who were put in situations who demonstrated faith and Swami demonstrated that how he took care of his life, took care of their lives at the end of it. Right? It's, it's almost like uh, this is true for all times. It is, not, it is not that faith works only when the avatar is in the human form. Faith works during all times. But there was a demonstration of how it works when an avatar comes down in a human form. And that's what all Bhagavatam is about that. When you say that this devotee was struggling and Krishna went and helped the devotee or Sabri was waiting for so many years and Rama went and redeemed her. These are demonstrations of how love begets divine love demonstrated in a, in a time frame that is uh, probably perceivable and conceivable for us. And the reason why we listen to all of these stories is also the same thing, right? It is not merely to sanctify time. We are sitting here and we listen to one hour of satsang. It is not that, okay, for this one hour, I managed to do nothing bad. I have sanctified my time. I mean, that's definitely something that is good. That's working for us. This one hour I'm spending speaking to all of you. I'm ensuring that I'm not thinking of anything else, doing anything else. But Bhagavatam is for something more than that. There's a very beautiful statement that Swami once made in one of his discourses. Swami said, Bhagavatam Vinandi, Bhagavatam Thinandi. He said, Bhagavatam Vinandi, listen to Bhagavatam, but don't stop at listening. Bhagavatam Thinandi. He said, eat Bhagavatam. Literally, that's what Swami said. Swami said, eat Bhagavatam, which means these stories should become a part of your thinking. When you see God coming to the rescue of a devotee, you should make that a part of, my, part of our understanding that this is how Swami comes to the rescue when there is a need. This is how Swami protects even when there seems to be no hope, right? And that is the reason we all spend time listening about all of these devotees. Oh, Swami did this, Swami did that. And even as I'm telling this, even as I'm speaking about uh, faith and all of these stories, I think even faith can be spoken of as being of two kinds. One is the faith in Swami's omnipotence. Is there anything that Swami cannot do? Is there any disease in this world that Swami cannot cure? Including the disease that we are all worried about now. You know, there cannot be a disease which has been there in the past. There's never going to be a disease in the future which Swami cannot deal with. And Swami has given ample example of that. I'm not going to go into that, but almost every devotee who has spent few years with Swami will tell that I had a disease like this, Swami cured it. I had an ailment like this, Swami cured this. Now I was in an accident and Swami cured this. All of that variety is so that our mind can know that there is absolutely nothing that Swami cannot handle. The faith in Swami's omnipotence. Right? There is this uh, very beautiful story that one of the devotees once narrated to me. Uh, this must have happened way back in the 60s. The old, good old days when Swami was in uh, Prashanti and sands around uh, Swami's mandir. 
there was this family, I think, in some uh, small town in the state of Tamil Nadu. A very humble family, not of very high means. Husband and a wife. And they had a small boy and this boy could not speak. He was born uh, deaf and dumb. I don't know whether he was born deaf, but he was definitely born dumb. Right? So they've been trying all kinds of medications, whatever was within their means. And eventually they come to know that you know, there is this Baba who cures a lot of people. Probably we should go and try to get his blessings. And being a family of very meager means, if they had to come all the way to Puttaparthi, they had to sell a little bit of their belongings, some furniture, some vessels they had in their house to make that trip. You know, that, was their, that, was, that was how poor they were. So they did that, husband, wife, and this little boy come to Puttaparthi. And when they come to Puttaparthi, you know, Swami decides to show up his Maya. They are sitting morning and evening. Swami doesn't speak to them. And those were times when Swami would speak to everybody who comes for darshan, right? There was no, uh, there's nothing like you're in form, you're out of form. No, everybody would get the opportunity. And in fact, Swami would call everybody for an interview. But Swami comes and for whatever reason, Swami chooses to completely ignore this family. And even as they're sitting there morning and evening, what do they see? All the rich devotees of Swami come and Swami spends so much time with them. So a few days go by. And then this mother of this little boy says, I think there's no point in us trying out here. He seems to be a Baba of the rich, right? He's a rich man's Baba. He's not for us. Let's go back. For some reason, the husband says, no, I, I think we're missing something here. The husband says that I don't think the Swami is like that. Maybe we just have to have a little more patience. So finally, the wife says, okay, you sit here and you can have your patience. I'm taking the kid and I'm going back. So that's what happens. The husband stays, the mother and the son leave. He stays for a week. Swami doesn't look at him. Swami doesn't call him. At the end of it, he exhausts whatever money he has and he has to go back home. So he goes back home and uh, the boy is still uh, with the same ailment. He's not able to speak. So when he goes back home, the mother says, see, I told you, he's not a Baba for the poor people. He's a Baba for the rich people. He's a Baba for Zamindars and ministers and the royalty. And uh, she was so upset with Swami. So she said, you know, take out all the pictures of this Baba that you have in the picture and throw it out. Right. And uh, it so happens that she was not satisfied with that. She wanted to show a resentment. So she takes one of the pictures of Swami and she puts it in the backyard. Right. In those days, the backyard used to be the place where you would have a common toilet. Right. So she puts Swami's picture there as though saying that, you know, this is where you belong. That's how upset we are with you. But the father says that, no, I think we shouldn't do that. You know, Swami, must, Swami will help us definitely. But nothing happens. This lady puts Swami's picture there. One night, late into the night, this little boy comes out of the house to ease himself in the middle of the night. And after he uh, goes to the toilet and he comes back, there's usually a bucket and a mug kept outside so that he can wash his feet and then come into the house. Right? Those are uh, practices that we always followed in those days. So the mother, mother had strictly told this boy that never come into the house after using the bathroom without washing your feet. But this boy was stuck in the middle of the night. It was very cold. It was very dark. There was a mug. There was a bucket over there with water, but there was no mug. So this boy didn't know how to wash his feet. Right? As, as you know, how Swami creates these very, very petty situations uh, to play out his leela. So this boy is standing there and he is dumb. He cannot call out to his mother. He is not able to reach out to the people inside who are sleeping there. And he turns around. Whom does he find? He finds a picture of Swami there, right? Quite appropriately placed next to the toilet by his mother. The mother thought that she was being uh, uh, disrespectful to Swami, but she was actually putting Swami in the exact place where he needed to be. So this boy looks at Swami's picture and he says, Swami, we came to you. You could have given me this faculty of speech. You could have cured me. Then I would not have been in this situation today. See, it's so cold. I don't know whom to call out to. I can't call out to anybody. And I can't go inside. My mother will get upset with me if I go in without washing my feet. And the boy starts crying, standing there. And after some time, the mother and the father inside, they wake up. And they say, do you hear some voice? I feel somebody is speaking outside the, in, in the backyard. 
and they look around they find that this little boy is missing and they when they go out they find this boy standing outside the bathroom crying and even as he was crying he was crying saying baba 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 and the husband and wife looked at each other and says what are you standing here and you know from when can you speak and this boy quite eloquently describes his predicament he says you know i came here and i used the bathroom he spoke right and in that instant you know standing there outside in the backyard looking at a picture discarded near the uh, washroom there swami had cured this boy and the father was delighted the father said see i told you swami will help us i told you swami will uh, cure this boy the mother was still a little you know she said you never know maybe it was just the cold and the boy was you know something happened and you know that's when we all become scientists you know when you don't want to believe swami you come up with all kinds of explanations so she said no no swami i mean no no it was so cold something must have happened and in the fear he started speaking so the husband and wife have an argument the father says no i think it is swami's grace the mother says no i don't think so so then they decide okay let's go to puttaparthi we'll go sit for darshan if swami comes and tells us that i cured the boy we will hold on to his feet for the rest of our lives if he against again chooses to ignore us good riddance you know we're going to come back we're not going to think of him anymore there's going to be no pictures of him anymore in our house so again they sell a few furniture or a few vessels that they have they make this trip to puttaparthi this time when they come and sit for darshan on the very first session swami calls them for an interview and when they go inside the interview room swami looks at this mother and swami says amma i only cured your son <laughs> you know you know almost like a pleading way amma please believe me <laughs> it was me who cured your son right is there anything that swami cannot do there is no signs which can be a barrier for swami's grace right there is there is no virus which can come and say that you know i am new your swami cannot deal with me right so when you listen to stories like this this is the faith in swami's omnipotence tomorrow if at all god forbid if any of us are in a situation we should have the complete faith that if swami chooses he can he can solve this problem of mine he can remove this ailment of mine he can uh, remove this disease or whatever it is right there's this other very beautiful story that one of the uh, doctors in our general hospital was once in the rating there was this this was again in the 60s or 70s when the general hospital was very small very less facilities and i think they just had a couple of doctors who were very dedicated and taking care but the facility was very primitive so there was this devotee an italian lady who had a fracture right so she was admitted in the hospital and uh, coming from an advanced and developed country she was completely appalled by the the facilities which, which were there in the general hospital like right? so she had complaints about everything she said oh the bed sheet is not clean the pillow is not clean so oh, that uh, you know the the bed is not comfortable and she was making the life of all the doctors and the nurses miserable she was complaining about everything and she was throwing tantrums so they didn't know what to do so they went to mandir and they told swami swami like this one patient has come please come and save us please come in you know do something about her and swami gives a hearty laugh and swami says don't worry i'll come i'll speak to her so swami makes a special trip to uh, general hospital just to see this italian devotee who has fractured a leg so swami comes to her and swami they've already put a cast in her leg and uh, you know that one visit from swami calms her down enormously and swami asks this lady so how many days are the doctors telling that your leg should be in this cast so she very grumpily she says swami they are telling me that it will be at least 15 days and swami tells her tells her 15 days no 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 one week is good enough right so swami tells her no no these doctors don't know one week is good enough so she is very happy swami comes out of the ward and swami comes to the doctors and swami tells the doctors right any doctors in the audience tip for you Swami tells her, tells the doctors, see, you should never tell a patient that it will take fifteen days. You tell one week, and after one week, you come and tell her you will take one more week, <laughs> right? Don't tell the whole thing in you know in one shot and then uh, scare the patient. So you should tell her just one week, madam, and after one week, you take a look at that and say, no, it looks like it needs another week. The patient also will be fine with that. 
So Swami gave this advice to the doctors and Swami left. One week goes by and this lady calls the doctors and says, remove my cast. Swami told one week. You can't tell the patient that this is what Swami told us. <laughs> you know, that will be like betraying what Swami had told them. So they were trying to convince her. They said, no, madam, yes, Swami told, but you know, your leg needs a little more time. You shouldn't take it out. Uh, but she wouldn't listen. She said, Swami told one week, it's going to be one week. The doctor said, nothing doing. You're under our care. You better listen to whatever we say. When all the doctors retire, this lady, somewhere she finds a uh, scissors and she cuts open her cast. And the next morning when the doctors and the nurse come, she's happily walking around the ward. And again, they're shocked. They don't know what to do. So they run to Swami. And they said, Swami, this is what happened. This lady has removed the cast herself. And Swami started laughing. Swami said, she had so much faith when I said one week, that one week was enough for her. Right? So all our doctors in the hospital, how much ever they treat the patients, how much ever they heal, they know who, who is the one who is actually healing the patients. Right? So when we listen to all these kind of stories, it is that confidence that we get in, in Swami's abilities. There was this uh, one student who had completed his education those days uh, before the university had began. Right? Uh, those days, the students used to do their undergraduation in the Brindavan College. And sometimes Swami would permit them to do their master's in uh, the Bangalore University or go to Anantapur and do their master's there. But Pretty much they would continue as Swami students. They would be allowed to come and sit with the students whenever they come and all of that. So there was this one batch which was graduating. So Swami was talking to them and Swami was telling them, so what are you going to do? So somebody said, Swami, I'm going to go back. My father wants, to take the, uh, wants me to come and join the business. And Swami was blessing all of them. So somebody was saying, Swami, I want to be with you. Please give me a job. So Swami came to this one particular boy. And this boy, you know, in probably must have very genuinely tried to be very polite to Swami. He said in Telugu, Swami, uh, I would like to continue here. Miku vilaite Anantapurlo miru MSc seat, if you give me. The way he said it in Telugu was, Swami, if it is possible for you, if you can get me a seat in Anantapur, uh, you know, SV University, I'll continue. Swami's face turned red. Swami said, what did you say? Swami said, what did you say? This guy didn't know what he said, which offended Swami so much. Swami said, did you say, if possible, did you say that? Swami said, if that is the faith that you have, then you don't deserve my interference. Swami said, I will not get you the seat. And Swami ensured that he go back. He goes back, right? See, Swami was so particular that even in the words that we say, even in, in the thoughts, that's what Swami told, uh, told Ranima, right? Your first thought should be faith. Your first thought that comes when you're in a situation is, Swami can deal with this. Swami has the ability to deal with that, right? So Swami would say that that expression is what we refer to as faith. But this is the faith in Swami's omnipotence. Swami can deal with anything. Swami can solve any problem. Swami can uh, you know, untangle any situation. But the next faith or the next level of faith is the faith in Swami's omniscience. See, when I have a problem and I pray to Swami, when I have a need and I pray to Swami, it automatically means that I believe that Swami can solve the problem. Otherwise, I wouldn't be asking Him at all. Right? When I pray to Swami, Swami, I'm in this problem. It means that Swami, I believe that you can solve this problem. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting my time praying to you. Right? So actually speaking, the faith and the omnipotence seems to be coming quite naturally to all of us. But when we put a faith, put a prayer in front of Swami, when we present a plea in front of Swami, when we say, Swami, I know you can solve this problem, I know you can answer this prayer, but I will let you answer this prayer if you want to. Right? I think at, at that stage, we are expressing our faith in Swami's omniscience. We are saying that, Swami, you know what is best. In my limited understanding, I'm making this prayer to you. I'm saying that, Swami, I, I want the seat in this educational institution or I, you know, I want this to happen in my business. In my limited understanding, I think that this is what is good for me. But I have 
higher faith in your understanding. I have higher faith in your knowledge of what is best for me and I accept it. Right? And that is the next step of faith. And that's why if you look at it, you know, Krishna describes the different kinds of devotees in uh, Bhagavad Gita. Artha, Arthati, Jignasu. Right? Artha, Arthati is somebody who says, I want a, you know, a solution to my health problems or somebody comes and says, I want this wealth, I want this success in my business. A Jignasu says that, you know, I want this wisdom. Even a Jignasu who comes and prays to Swami, I want this wisdom, thinks that it is good for me to have this wisdom. But that is why Swami says the highest form of devotion is actually a Jnani. Now, really, if you look at it, when Swami says that there are four categories of devotees, it should actually be Artha, Arthati, Jignasu and Bhakti, Bhakta. Right? When you say that the fourth one is the uh, purest form of devotion, but Swami says the fourth is a Jnani. Because the Jnani is one who understands that the present is perfect. The knowledge that right now, whatever I'm going through, be it an up, be it a down, be it darkness, be it light, whatever I am right now going through is perfect. Because whatever Swami chooses for me is perfect, is best for me. Right? I think that that is the idea which we all have to get to. And if you really, uh, I mean, we're all participating in all of these sessions, we're coming for bhajans, I'm, I'm here in Parthi. We all claim to be devotees. So whatever be our other prof profession, whatever be our other uh, you know, things that we, we are occupying ourselves with, when we come before Swami as a devotee, I think it becomes mandatory that we grow in devotion. We become better devotees. As that devotee asked, our goal should be to become an ideal devotee. right? And that comes with this complete understanding. And as I said, when Swami was physically interacting, Swami gave us these examples of people who, who actually shined as such devotees. There's this very popular story, I'm sure most of you might be knowing about this devotee and about this incident. It's a very popular incident. There is this devotee by name uh, Rama Brahma. Right? He's a caretaker of the Vrindavan Ashram. Phenomenal devotee, whoever has known him, have uh, no words but words of praise for the kind of devotion and love and surrender that he had. There is this beautiful episode, as I said, many of you may be aware of it. His son was going to get married in Vrindavan, right? So the, the, the family of the girl that was going to get married to him had traveled all the way from his native place to Vrindavan. Swami had accommodated all of them. Swami had promised, I think, to perform the marriage. Everything was set, you know. You, you can imagine a whole marriage party coming all the way. And they're all excited about this. All of a sudden, one evening, Swami calls Rama Brahmam. I think the next day or the day after that was supposed to be the marriage. Swami calls this devotee Rama Brahmam Garu and says, go and tell the girl's family that the marriage is called off, that I don't want the marriage to happen. And this devotee does not even ask Swami why. You know, he doesn't even say, Swami, what explanation I'm going to give? Swami tells this to him. He says, okay, Swami. He walks straight to those people. He goes to them and says, the marriage is not happening. We have called off the marriage. You can imagine the anger and the uh, resentment which he would have faced from that side. They were so upset with him. They were angry. They were like, you know, they were using foul language against him and against Swami. And they were so upset. And they began packing the things and they were about to leave the next day. And what happens the next day? Ram Ramam Garu's son, who was supposed to get married, the marriage was for him. A snake bites him and he passes away. Right? The boy who was supposed to get married. And you can imagine the relief that that family would have felt. Then the, the, the family of the girl, they come and literally fall at Ram Ramam Garu's feet and says, you know, what a great disaster you have saved us from. What a great disaster Swami has saved us from. Imagine if the marriage had happened the girl would have be, become a widow overnight. And, you know, we are talking about different times, right? People don't take these things lightly. They will say that inauspiciousness and inauspicious person. And they said, what a great grand disaster you have saved us from. But imagine the, the, the devotion of this devotee 
who did not even question Swami. He said, Swami, if you tell me something, it must be for my good. It's very easy for me to, you know, when you narrate this incident, okay, so this is why Swami said that. But there are a hundred questions that can be asked. Why didn't Swami stop the snake from biting that little, that innocent boy? Why didn't Swami save his life? Or why didn't Swami do that? Or why didn't Swami postpone the wedding? Or I mean, There could be a hundred questions. But the devotee never asked the question, right? And that's what qualified him as that devotee. If you tell me something, I know it is right for me and I do it. So this is the tool that Swami gives. Devotion is we have to get there where there are ups and downs seem equal to me. How do we, how do we manage with that? Because the mind, mind does feel ups and downs. So Swami says, whatever happens to you is good for you is a tool. But maybe I'll just extend it a little more than that. See, when I, when I tell this to Swami, that Swami, whatever you do in my life is good for me. It is almost like I'm telling Swami, Swami, I accept whatever you do to me because it is good for me. Right? Even then, there is this idea of what is good for me and what is bad for me in my mind. And I'm telling Swami that I, whatever you do is acceptable because it is good for me. I think the real devotion is when we step it ahead, when we say, Swami, whatever you do for me is acceptable, period. I don't care in what way it is good for me, in what way it is bad for me, in what way it is going to help me grow. Right? That's what, that's what Rama Brahman did. There is no question of reasoning. How is this good for me? And how is this going to work out? You know, is this going to change? Whatever you give me is acceptable for me. You know, when we sit in Mandir, we all have our favorite sweets, right? We all have, I like Moti Chod Laddu, I like this. And sometimes being students, we are bugged of a certain sweet which keeps coming, repeating too often. And you say, oh, let's hope it's not that sweet this time. But nevertheless, whatever is the sweet, we'll eat it. Why? Because it is prasadam. And what is prasadam is always acceptable. The moment something becomes prasadam, what I like, what I don't like, actually does not matter. Right? In our tradition, that's why we have all kinds of prasadams. You know, when you have ugadi, they give you a prasadam which is bitter, which is, which is probably not something that you always relish. But we accept it because it comes with a tag prasadam. And Swami says that that is the, that is the uh, nature that a devotee has to develop. In fact, in the Upanishads, this is referred to as Ishwara Prasada Buddhi. Ishwara Prasada Buddhi means the understanding, the intelligence to accept whatever happens in one's life as a prasadam from the Lord. We must all picture this. You know, imagine, imagine Swami standing at the gateway of your life. Whatever comes into my life, the worst person, the worst trouble, it has come to my presence after taking Swami's approval. It cannot come before me if Swami has not approved it. And whatever Swami approves is acceptable to me. When we come to that, that attitude, right? And this can come only with practice, right? As Swami would say, this has got to be practiced. Anything, and as uh, Krishna tells, you know, uh, he says only with practice it comes. The mind is difficult to deal with. You have to practice. And how do you practice? Swami would say, if you want to learn swimming, you have to jump into the pool. If you want to master the art of moving around in the dark, you have to have darkness around you. Isn't it? So the only way we can develop faith is when we are put in situations where Faith is required. There is this very beautiful dialogue. Some of you must have seen this movie. It's a very form famous Hollywood movie. It's a, if I'm not wrong, it's Ivan Almighty, right? Where Morgan Freeman comes as God. There is this very beautiful dialogue that he gives there. We quote it in all our radio satsangs. You know, many times we've quoted this. He says, I've just got that quote here. He says, if someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If he prayed for courage, 
does god give him courage or does he give him opportunities to be courageous so when we tell that i want to develop that faith i want to develop that love situations like we are in now we should be grabbing it with both our hands right when we are put in situations where where we are doubtful where we are in the dark where we are in the midst of negativity as devotees we should rejoice at that moment ah here is an opportunity for me to practice surrender here is an opportunity for me to practice faith here is an opportunity for me to look at a problem and say you have come to me because swami has given me given you to me you are nothing short of prasadam right and this is an opportunity that swami is giving us all together and that's why i i, I would often tell you know faith is a very abstract concept how do you define faith how do you speak of faith how do you qualify faith but faith expresses itself as certain emotions and one of those emotions is fearlessness faith is fearlessness right and that is why when swami would raise both his hands and bless us swami would call it abhaya hasta right he it's a conferring of abhaya it's a conferring of fearlessness and when swami is giving us fearlessness swami is actually gifting us faith so at some point we have to look at swami and say swami please come and solve all my problems at some point we have to look at swami and say swami give me whatever problem you want but ensure that i always hold on to you with love and i accept all of that because it has come to you from me right so i thought i uh, this is the these are the thoughts i wanted to share with all of you thank you very much for your very patient listening if there are any questions i can i think i'm adventurous enough to try to uh, feel them prem there are certain questions i'll just read it out to you sure sure is silence equal to devotion is it equanimity uh yeah that's a very interesting question the thing with swami says is you know there is always in devotion or in the spiritual path there is always an overlap between tamas and sattva right tamas is when you are when you are you know when you are fearless also you look like a devotee when you are very quiet and you don't want to speak up and you don't want to take any action that time also you appear like a devotee right and that's why that genuineness is is the onus is upon us swami so would say that even about meditation when he speaks somebody who is sleeping and somebody who is in deep meditation appear to be the same but sleep is a sign of tamas meditation is a sign of sattva so you cannot always qualify silence as being that of devotion but definitely inner silence whatever happens around if you are able to maintain your tranquility yes that exactly is what devotion is all about but it does not mean slackness it does not mean slothfulness that becomes tamas and for most part nobody can judge that other than yourself that's why in the spiritual path you are all by yourself you have to find out for yourself genuinely where you are are you being a devotee or are you being a hypocrite okay uh, another question how do we differentiate between swami's will or decision between and our lack of hard work when we lose a certain opportunity or a task how to maintain equanimity at that point in time i think the <clears throat> various situations differ right many people ask this question when there is a deadline it's actually very easy let's say you're doing a 100 meter dash your hard work is only till you reach the line right so you're happy <laughs> you have a there's a clear uh, demarcation to how long you want to hard work you have to work hard once uh, uh, one of the listeners who is doing research asked me this question how do you know if you have tried hard enough right because research is something that keeps stretching there is actually no easy way of knowing that we often think of surrender as something that comes at the end of effort right we have put all the effort and at the end of it i can lean back and say swami now i surrender to you but probably surrender is something that has to go hand in hand with effort right every day you you probably never know some some uh some tasks that we have to take care of like for instance if you're a parent if you're taking care of a child you never know when your duty ends right you never know when you've done enough probably some efforts are lifelong 
that is why this attitude of prasad buddhi as i said you know prasad buddhi is always spoken of as being in conjunction with arpan buddhi they say ishwara arpan buddhi and ishwara prasad buddhi whatever you do whatever task that you do you make it as an offering to god and whatever result comes you accept it as a prasadam but in the process you know the the practicality is never lost let's say i am a teacher you know i go into the class and i teach tomorrow if all my students fail i i can't sit back and say that okay swami this is your prasadam you can accept it but you should go back into your effort and say is there something else that i can do is there some other way i can try to get my uh, lesson across right so the practicality remains you don't give up practicality at all but at the same time you you use this surrender as 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 a as a mental cushion for you you know you don't get worked up too much because at the end of it, there's a very very beautiful uh, piece which abraham lincoln writes um, i think it's 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 called the meditation on the will or meditation on the divine will it is there on google if you search for that you will find that you now we all know abraham lincoln's greatest struggle in his life he was trying to free some of the american states uh from the grip of slavery right they were practicing slavery and he wanted to abolish that there were some states in the united states they wanted to retain slavery so at one point you know he kind of loses it he says you know i, I mean i am trying to abolish slavery i think this is god's work i am trying to help people who are poor and who are downtrodden i think this is god's work why is it not happening i am taking good noble work i am putting my best and pure intentions into it i am working so hard why is it not happening and then he he kind of in a meditative state writes down this thing that's why he calls it the meditation on divine will he says if god had willed that this problem should have been solved it would have been solved the very fact that it has not been solved is that god wanted this contest between somebody who's trying to do something and somebody who's stopping him and there is something to gain out of this contest if there is nothing to gain out of this tug of war god would not have willed this so he says if god had willed the resolution the resolution would have happened if it go if god had willed that it should not happen it would have not happened but probably god ha- god has willed this tussle and that's why the tussle tussle continues it's a very beautiful piece and I, actually that's so true with all of us so surrender is not something that we we practice at the end of our effort surrender is something that we have to practice even as we are doing our effort make it a part of our everyday activity itself i hope that answers so we have another question prem uh, yeah. in almost all stories of swami including the ones you narrated today there is always an element of uncertainty and suspense or other tension faced by the devotee before the infinite grace comes why there's a part two to this why doesn't swami present the reason why he commands that way we would have more faith if we know the future shown by swami swami does both if you really ask me there are many many episodes where swami clearly explains there was this devotee who came to swami as a very very rich man again a devotee i had the opportunity to speak to he came as a very rich businessman and uh, one day swami actually told him that you're going to lose all your property right imagine swami calls him and says i'm going to make you poor and then swami gives him an explanation for that swami tells him that uh, swami explains by giving a certain episode in his life and swami says that was actually the end of this life for you you were supposed to have died at that point i gave you an extension of life so that you can have this opportunity to spend your time with swami right swami said i'm giving you an extension of life but what was supposed to happen is you're supposed to die now and you're supposed to be born in a poor family in the next birth and swami said i am bringing that poverty into this life so that you are able to finish off that karma even when you are going through this opportunity of knowing swami and having faith in swami right so i think there are many many cases like this where swami does explain why somebody is going through that but as i said the ultimate stage where we are supposed to get is we should not need an explanation we should not have to go and ask swami swami explain why you are doing this to me we should be able to look at swami and say swami if you say it is enough you say yes or no it is enough right and in many many episodes swami would say this 
there was this uh, one of our lecturers who had finished his masters and he was waiting for Swami to give him the opportunity to uh, work. And in those days, most of the lecturers wanted to be in Prashantinilyam because you know Swami was spending a lot of time in Prashantinilyam. The hospitals were coming up and the new, uh, the MBA program was coming up. So Swami was spending a lot of time in Prashantinilyam. So everyone wanted to be in Parthi. So there was this teacher who had graduated. Swami calls him inside the interview room. I may be a little fuzzy with my details, but I'll give you the uh, gist of it. So Swami calls him inside the interview room and Swami very hesitantly, Swami asks him, uh, will, will, is it okay if I put you in Brindavan? I send you to Brindavan, is it okay for you? This, this uh, student looked at Swami and said, Swami, why do you ask? Don't ask, Swami, you just command, you just say, go, I'll go. I will not ask you why and all that. And Swami's face lit up when this boy said this. And Swami, you know, patted him and Swami said, I know you will say this. <laughs> Swami said, I know this will be your answer. That is why I've already told the VC and the, I've already printed the <laughs> application or appointment order. Right. But still Swami wanted to hear it from that boy saying that Swami, I mean, I might have a hundred reasons. I might want a hundred things. That's why I said, if we are still going to hold on to that thing saying that whatever Swami does is acceptable to me because it is good for me. Somewhere the reasoning will come. In what way is this good for me? Is this really good for me? I thought it was good for me. Now it has become bad. Right? That is why we should never give scope for that reasoning at all. That's why that, there is that beautiful appellation for Lord in, in, in the Vedas. Lord is referred to as Aprameya. Aprameya means, Pramana means the way we conceive or perceive objects around us. You know, when I, when I see an object, I have a laptop in front of me. I see it through my eyes, which means this laptop has a shape, it has a color, it has a certain form. Those are all objects which come under the, uh, you know, the pramanas, the way of knowing them. And the Lord is referred to as an aprameya. No senses, no mind, no intelligence, no intellect can understand God. And that is the fact, right? The beautiful analogy which is often given is, we all are like those salt dolls, which have become very adventurous and we are telling, I'm going to go and measure this ocean, right? We are standing at the edge of the seashore and saying, I'm going to go and measure the depth of this ocean. But it is a good stupidity to have because when the salt doll tries to measure the depth of the ocean, it becomes the ocean, right? That's essentially what this path is. In trying to understand Swami, when we start off trying to understand Swami, but somewhere down the line, we realize that there's no point in trying to understand Swami, right? And maybe that is why Swami gives a lot of suspense. Swami gives a lot of this opportunity where you don't wait for Swami to come and tell you. Swami might explain it later, right? But Swami wants that surrender. It's probably an opportunity for us to go and tell Swami that Swami, you don't have to explain it to me. Whatever you tell me to do, it's acceptable to me, right? And the second point is probably speakers like me pick up episodes which have a little element of surprise and element of uh, you know, suspense in them that, that makes interesting storytelling also. <laughs> so, Prem, moving on, there's one last question I'd like to take. Uh, right. Just a lot of time, so I think we'll have to restrict it to that. When we hear the satsang, it's easy to say to practice. But when the situation occurs, we cannot actually keep our faith. It becomes very hard. So please tell us how can we keep faith in all situations? There is a very, very standard procedure for that. It, it is spoken of in all our Upanishads. It is referred to as the process of Shravana, Manana and Nididhyasana. Right? Shravanam is what we are all doing here. Or when you read a book or uh, you know, when you listen to somebody speaking, when you see a video. Any way in which you take from outside is referred to as Shravana. Manana is the same satsang which happens inside your head, right? That is what it is. And when I, when I made a reference to what Swami says, you know, uh, Bhagavatam Tinandi, Swami said, you must eat Bhagavatam. What that means is after having eaten it, it has to be constantly contemplated upon. In good times, in bad times, when nothing is going on, right? That is the process that will make it a part of us. And there's this very beautiful analogy which Swami gives. Uh, it's a Chinnakata which Swami would narrate. Only Swami can give us stories like this. There is the story of this boy 
who is going from one town to the other right and in those days there are no dabas on the way there are no uh, you know no restaurants that you can stop by and eat so the mother what she does is she packs some food for him and like in the olden days she packs it up in a cloth the roti is together and uh, you know there's a small pot in which she puts the curry or whatever and that's a little bit of weight right one and a half two kgs or whatever it is so this boy is walking from this one village to the other and swami says at one point he's so tired because it's mid noon the sun is beating down and then he has to carry this lunch and go so he's getting tired so swami says what is this man what is this boy do he finds a nice shady tree he sits under it he eats the food he digests it he sits there for some time and now the burden is gone and now he's got energy also right so he says double bonus now he doesn't have to carry that bundle anymore and he is also energized and swami says if you keep carrying whatever i tell in my discourses only in your head it will only become a burden so what you carry in your head has to be chewed and has to be assimilated and that is the process of shravana manana nididhyasana right and much of this does not come naturally much of what we do in everyday life never came to us naturally we did, we were not born with the ability to walk we were not born with the ability to talk and that's why some you keep on telling practice 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 and every time a difficult situation comes in life swami says if you are a good student i don't think any of i wouldn't claim myself to be a good student in college but swami would say if you are a good student when they announce an examination you will feel very happy right swami will say oh examination is coming because every examination is an opportunity to test yourself and every examination is an opportunity to progress so swami would say that when you when you listen to all of this yes it will not come naturally right because swami would say it comes like this it goes like that that is the natural way it happens but when it comes into your ear swami says put it through this process of shravana manana niti dhyasana talk to yourself become your own satsang become your own good company right and then you will find that eventually you will it becomes a, it becomes a reflex reaction just like anything that we do in life the moment we i mean i mean we all have come to swami i came to swami when i was 17 now the moment i see somebody in whites automatically i say sai ram that call for practice right that did not come naturally so swami says eventually it will come to a point where as i said the first thought is anger and upset and you are upset no somebody no less than tyagaraja was caught up in that swami narrates that beautiful incident of at one point tyagaraja gets completely vexed and he writes that beautiful kriti where he says nalo bhakti leda nilo shakti leda he says do i not have bhakti or do i do you not have shakti and then he says no no i have bhakti you only don't have shakti right he was so vexed and then after some time he says what have i said no rama forgive me what i have is very little what bhakti i have is also your gift whatever you give is acceptable to me so if somebody like tyagaraja needed a little bit of time to absorb and understand all of this don't be too hard on yourself i think we can cheerfully practice it and we all can make it a part of our life